These are bicycle license plates from defunct programs in British Columbia. And here's some from Edmonton, Alberta. In fact, it wasn't just these Canadian plates, they were in Portland and Boston and even San Diego, all defunct, which begs the question, where did they all go? My name is Nick and I talk about the marvels of micromobility, subscribe for regular content. If you've ever found yourself in the comment section of any cycling YouTube video, Instagram short, or Twitter thread, you may have seen calls for cyclists to be registered, insured, licensed, and even taxed. Now, I talked about taxing cyclists in a previous video. To recap, we already tax cyclists through general taxation, which helps pay for roads and bike lanes. So today, I'd like to take a look at bicycle registration and license plates. Many jurisdictions required cyclists to be registered and have a plate or tag attached to the bicycle, but now, for the most part, it's a practice relegated to antiquity. So let's take a look at where they went, where they still exist, and whether or not it's even worth having. To get there, I think it's best to start at why such things were introduced in the first place. Since the invention of the safety bicycle and its predecessors, they have attracted the ire of many, and in the late 1800s, bicycle registrations and plates began sweeping the globe. The main reasons they were implemented is the belief that licensing and registration could address two major problems, theft and compliance with the law. The logic goes that the plates could help positively identify the vehicle and by extension, the registered owner, to return the bicycle in case of theft or to dole out punishment for traffic infractions. Specifically in Vancouver, such a program was introduced in 1901. Created to fund the construction of new bike pathways, the bylaw required the registration of bicycles at the annual cost of $1. That's about $30 today. The tag would be affixed to the bicycle to prove that the owner had indeed paid their annual fee. And as the years went on, not only the physical license plates changed, so did the intended purpose. As mentioned, it was now mainly intended for theft recovery and to help identify reckless riders who had broken the law or fled the scene of a collision. However, by the 70s, like many other cities around the world, such practices fell out of fashion. The most obvious reasons why these programs ceased were the cost to the city budget and children. But more on that later. And while most places have gotten rid of them, they do still exist, sort of. Some countries and municipalities have licenses for speed pedal X or any electric micromobility device that can exceed 30 kilometers per hour on their own, which is something that I am not necessarily opposed to, but those aren't people-powered bicycles, strictly speaking. Bicycle couriers in Vancouver require a license at the price of $171 a year, but that's business. So as for privately owned bicycles, the first example is Denmark, which has a mandatory VIN system that requires all bicycles sold to have a unique code printed on the frame. This is on the manufacturer side and is mainly an anti-theft measure. And since 1999, the state of Hawaii requires a one-time $15 payment for the registration and licensing of all bicycles with a wheel diameter of 20 inches or more. Again, a theft recovery measure for the most part. And Japan probably has the most extensive bicycle bureaucracy. In Tokyo, for example, there's a fee of 660 yen for bicycle registration, which is valid for 10 years. Again, for theft recovery. But you also must obtain bicycle insurance to ride in Tokyo, which is something I will surely cover in the future. So get subscribed for that. The last example is North Korea. And take this, like most information from the Hermit Kingdom, with a grain of salt. But it is said that cyclists in the country must get a license to use their bikes, pass a road safety test, and register their bicycles. You can make up your own mind whether or not we should take after that dictatorship. So, are they worth having? The short answer is no. As a tool to reduce the frequency of two-wheel scoff laws, maybe there is some utility. Firstly is accountability. Having a unique identifying code on a bike may encourage cyclists to ride more safely and be more considerate as they won't be anonymous. Second is to help prevent theft, or at least help with returning stolen bikes to the rightful owner, though we have seen this addressed by other means, like the Danish example of having a serial number printed on the bike frame, and while not mandatory in other places, is actually already pretty common, like 529 Garage, which works with the police to return stolen bikes to registered owners. Lastly, it may reduce the frequency of complaints I see about cyclists. Probably not, but a man can dream. And one negative of bike license plates comes from an 1894 Irish Times article which outlines one particular flaw of the Parisian laws that required cyclist license plates to include not only a unique number, but also the home address of the bike owner. Some thief put the provision of the law to an ingenious use. Mm. Seeing a bicycle one day in the Paris streets, he took off the plaque, ran to the given address, and conveyed to the relatives of the cyclist that he had been run over. In the confusion, the thief managed to gain admission to the residence and laid his hands on a number of valuables. Okay, that was just for fun. The first practical negative to note is that proper licensing and registration systems 
will undoubtedly discourage riding. And while we try to make our cities more livable by getting people out of cars, introducing bureaucracy to the equation will simply be a counterproductive disruption to the bike's appeal as a transportation alternative. Some people would still continue to cycle daily, but many would simply prefer to avoid the hassle. Naturally, this will lead to heavier car traffic and more inconvenience for everyone involved. And as previously mentioned, this brings up the question of how underage riders and children will register their bikes. I mean, can you even ride a bike if you're underage? And this is one of the biggest reasons these systems were abolished in the past. Municipalities concluded that it resulted in an unconscious contravention of the law at a young age, resulting in poor relations between police officers and children. I remember the police stopping me when I was riding my bike as a child and giving me a voucher to a local movie rental store for wearing a helmet. Think about the impression that leaves on a child as opposed to stopping an eight-year-old to check their license for rolling through a stop sign. It also created problems with education and testing. In 1957, the Long Island community of Manhasset required children to take a cycling test. Half of the kids who took that test failed. And that is how you get children to stop riding to school, taking away their freedom and independence until they're old enough to drive. And don't get me wrong, youth cycling education is a good thing that should be prescribed to every public school child but that can be undertaken by nonprofits. For example, hub cycling here in Vancouver. It doesn't prevent theft, but we already went over this. It's also a drain on police resources, something that many municipalities are already in short supply of. According to credits of Fort Lauderdale's free bicycle registration program, it can and has been used as a tool for racial profiling. Lastly, it's expensive. I'm not even talking about the price that the individual cyclist would have to pay, but the money that will be fronted by all taxpayers to implement such a system. The people involved, the materials, the enforcement, it's been combed over many times. Like in Toronto, where they found that for cyclists to actually cover the cost of the bureaucracy involved in such a system would have to pay a fee that would regularly exceed the value of the very bicycle that they wanted to register. A system like that would inevitably relegate cycling to a niche hobby for the elite, making a subsidy the only option, which would not only be a negative to the city budget on the outset, but the discouragement would reduce the societal benefits we would all receive from a shift away from car dependency. The reality is, while some believe that any road user should be licensed and registered, it ignores the fundamental difference between cars and bicycles. Cars are simply far more dangerous. A bicycle and its rider are not much more than a fast pedestrian. Some kind of licensing and registration program will just cause more negative externalities than it's worth. Some people and politicians don't know this, but others do and still use it as a cudgel to subvert the goals of groups who are working to make cycling a safe and practical way to move people around our cities. I mean, if we had unlimited budgets, I could see a license and registration program potentially bring a safety benefit to our streets. However, the depths of our pockets are finite, and there are a myriad of other tools worth investing in that have been proven to work. Public awareness campaigns, skills training of youth, and most importantly, bicycle-friendly facilities such as dedicated bike lanes, signaling, and properly calmed local streets. These are more effective in quelling the safety concerns and meeting the goals of cyclist compliance with traffic laws than investing in licensing and registration. So, no, I don't believe it's worth having. The costs simply outweigh the benefits. The last thing we want to do is undermine the very essence of what makes bicycling so great. And it's not just the feeling, but actual freedom. And with that, my name is Nick. Thanks for watching.